Good morning. We are now in the third of the five books of Moshe. In the last book uh, in Shemot, it spoke about how Hashem took the Jews out of Egypt and then about receiving the Torah and then about building the Mishkan. But now in this book, now that the Mishkan has been completely set up, the part of this discussion is about the sacrificial offerings. In other words, the actual use of the Mishkan to do what we are meant to do. So these sacrificial or offerings carried out in the sanctuary and then later on the Beis HaMikdash. Now, the Torah laws, the Torah is eternal and the laws and stories bring relevant guidance to everyday life. And this applies to the laws of the sacrifices and the other aspects of the Beis HaMikdash, which we're not doing right now, but it says in the commandment, and you shall make a sanctuary requiring the Jews to construct the Beis HaMikdash has the specific goal, which is the rest of the Pasek, that I, God, will dwell within. And it says, will dwell within them. So there is an aspect of the sacrificial offerings that are laws that have to do with the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash. And there are aspects of it that have to do with our inner being and offering to Hashem and making a Mishkan so that God will dwell within each of us. So these laws are not so easy to relate to because we haven't done sacrificial animal sacrifices in many, many years, it's been almost 2000 years, and it, we haven't done it. But the Jewish scholars have been trying to understand and continue to understand the inner importance of the sacrifices and what they say about the relationship between humanity and God. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So Rabbi Shnur Liadi, Rabbi Shnur Zalman of Liadi, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, noticed uh, something about the grammar in the second line of the Parsha today. And we're gonna speak about that. So it says, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when one of you offers a sacrifice to the Lord, the sacrifice must be taken from the cattle, the sheep or the goats. Now that's the meaning. But if you look at the Pasek, if you look at the line in Hebrew, the word order is unusual. You would expect to read Adam Mikem Kiyakriv when one of you offers a sacrifice, but instead it says Adam Kiyakriv Mikem when one offers a sacrifice of you. So what does this mean when one offers a sacrifice of you. The sacrifice is of me, of each of us. So we have to understand what does that mean? <clears throat> now the word korban, which is the word for sacrifice, has its root in the word karov, meaning close. So bringing an offering means coming close to God. And the Torah teaches us that coming close to God is dependent on each individual. So if a person really wants to come close to God, he can. If he really wants to reach, he can reach very high and deep connection with God. All he has to do is to want to. But today we're going to talk about actions that help us to come close to Hashem that have to do with these animal sacrifices and what it means that we're offering them from ourselves. And remember, we said that we are, it's from the cattle, the sheep, or the goats. All right, now the essence of sacrifice, Rabbi Shinra Zalman says, is that we offer ourselves. We're offering ourselves to God. What does that mean? So we bring to God our faculties, our energies, our thoughts, and emotions. So the physical form of sacrifice is an animal offered on the altar. But that's only an external manifestation of an inner act. So 
keep this in mind. We are trying, what we want to do is bring our faculties, our energies, our thoughts, and our emotions to God. So how can we do this? So this is the real sacrifice, mikem, of you. We're giving God something of ourselves. What is it that we give God when we offer a sacrifice? Now, along with the ceremonial acts of the Kohen, means what the Kohen actually does to offer the animal, the, the intention of the donor is actually very important in the offering. So the animal offering was symbolic of a greater sacrifice, that of the giver himself. Now, it's very interesting that there are many different kinds of offerings. Some offerings are guilt offerings and sin offerings if somebody has done something wrong. It says in the halacha that if a person gives an offering and he doesn't mean it, or he's not focusing on it, you know, like, when somebody says, yeah, I'm sorry. And they don't mean it and they don't care and they're re not real about it, then the offering doesn't count. Along, there are many mitzvahs, actually with most mitzvahs, that there's like a body and a soul in the mitzvah. So when we say a bracha, glad I'm reminding myself and we're all reminding ourselves, that when we say a bracha on food, that we have to say Baruch, Ata, Shem, that we really mean it. You are the source of this food and I am grateful for this food. But when we're just trying to get to the food, Baruch Ata, oh yeah, where's the chow? Then that is considered to be okay. But in some ways it's like a body without a soul. It's the outside of the mitzvah, but it's not the inside of the mitzvah. It's not the soul of the mitzvah. Ideally, we are meant to be doing what we do as whole people and making bodies and souls, doing a mitzvah that has both a body and a soul. Now, it's better to do it than not to do it. So even if it's just a body and it's just cursory, okay, fine. It's all right. You did it but it's better not to just do it, but to mean it. So that is work on its own. So we're talking about the intention of the donor of the offering, but when somebody is coming to the Beis HaMikdash or to the Mishkan and he's bringing an offering and he's asking God to forgive him for something, he says, take your animal here, whatever, I'm sorry. That doesn't count because he didn't mean it. The person has to have the intention. So this is, this is very, very important. And it shows the holiness of the Beis HaMikdash, that there it has to be real and complete because you're saying you're sorry. So what is the intention of the do, do, donor of the offering in general? Okay, so we need to understand this, that there is the animal and there's the divine within us. So we have an animal soul and a godly soul. And they are struggling for domination. And the fact is that you can't make a bargain. Okay, you go be an animal here and I'll go be godly here. You know, let's divide it up, it doesn't work like that. The fact is that they both fighting for complete control. So how are we doing it? How can we work on ourselves in such a way that the divine soul has control. And what does this have to do with an animal offering? So the animal takes a different form in each person. It's a very interesting concept. Not everybody's animal soul is the same, but in general, the animal soul in each person is urging man to earthly physical pleasures as opposed to serving God and concern for the soul. So the animal is, let's have a good time. Or the animal could just be, I'm hungry, or I'm tired. Taking care of the self, taking care of the body. That's what the animal does. So the Torah is teaching us that the offering must be from you. What does that mean? That every person has to look for 
and recognize his own animal. So we're actually going to talk about these animals and we have to recognize ourselves there. So a person has to know his own feelings and actions for what they are. And it's very important that we don't fool ourselves because if we say, ah, I'm such a great guy, even though what happens is it becomes not possible to do anything with it. But when we say, look, this is not such a great character trait that I have and I need to fix it and I need to work on it, then what happens is we're able to take that animal aspect of ourselves and work on correcting it. So the sacrifice is meant to emphasize to the person what he needs to do with himself. Now, the value of the offering, and there are different values. And, and in the Torah, it says, if you can afford it, you bring this. And if you can afford less, then you bring that. And so it's, the point isn't only the value of the offering, which should be appropriate to the person, but it's about how much of himself the person is offering to his creator. So the Jewish mystics, among them of Shnur Zalman, spoke about these two souls within us, the animal soul called the Nefesh of Bahamit and the godly soul. On one hand, we are physical beings. We are part of nature and we have physical needs. Needs for food, water, shelter, and we are born and we live and we pass away. And Ecclesiastics puts it, man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits both of them. As one dies, so the, dies the other one. Both have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is a mere fleeting breath. This is how Ecclesiastics talks but it is talking about the body. But we're not just animals. And we have within us desires for connection to Hashem, desires to be connected eternally to God, which we are. The soul is connected eternally to God. And we can speak think, speak, and communicate. And we can listen and we can reach out to others and we can make choices. This only a human being has. And we are the one life form that is in the universe that can ask the question, why? So that we can figure out what God would like us to do. And we can formulate ideas and be moved by high ideals. So we're not governed by biological drives alone. That's what we're talking about here. Who are we? Are, we're not just animals. We have an animal soul, but we're not animals. Physically, you know, Ecclesiastic is saying we're almost nothing. Spiritually, we are connected to eternity and we have a godly soul. So sacrifice when we understand it psychologically is that what we offer to God is not just an animal, but the nefesh of Bahamit, the animal soul within us. So we are, what are we meant to do with this animal soul? We are meant to refine it, offer it to God. So how could we understand this? So a hint is given by the three types of animals mentioned in the verse. It talks about a behema, about bakar, and tzon. Tzon is, um, is a goat or a sheep. Each represents a separate animal-like feature of the human personality. Now, it's interesting that not everybody is the same. So let's see what we can see from ourselves in this. The behema, it's very interesting. It taught when somebody calls somebody behema, yeah, you're an animal. That's not a compliment. Why? Because the behema, there's nothing wrong with the animal who is a behema, but when a person acts like a behema, it means you're just so unrefined. 
It represents the animal instinct itself. Now the word refers to domesticated animals. So we're not talking about savage in instincts of a predator, but it means is, what it means is something more tame. Animals spend their time searching for food. Their lives are involved in the struggle to survive. But, okay, so that's what a behemoth does. But to, what does it mean to sacrifice the behemoth in ourselves? It means to be moved by something more than only survival. This is something that a person can see that the behemoth aspect is looking for, <coughs> you know, the ice cream in the freezer. You know, let me, let me add that ice cream. And that is not, it's okay to eat the ice cream. You have to know who you are and how much and not eat like a behemoth, to eat like a human being. So, to sacrifice the animal, the behemoth within us is to be moved by something more than only survival. Now the godly soul within us is the force that makes us look up. It's very interesting that a, one of the differences an animal is made, horizontal, is made horizontally. So it looks ahead and looks down. A human being is upright. And so the human being can look up. And the godly soul within us is the force that makes us look up beyond the physical world, beyond just survival, in search of meaning, purpose, and goal. Okay, so this is what we're seeing that with the behemoth, how do we offer the behemoth to God is that we're not only thinking about more, more survival, got to have a lot of food, got to have a lot of sleep, got to have a lot of, instead, not just, you know, look out there for, you know, searching and grazing all the time. But what it means is that we look up, that we realize that the purpose of the eating or whatever it is that we're doing so that we should be able to utilize our time to serve, to serve Hashem. So the godly soul helps us to look up beyond the physical world, beyond survival in search of meaning, purpose, and goal. So this is something that when we're offering the animal inside ourselves, then the behemoth, there is a certain saying, okay, God, I'm not just going to be a behemoth. I'm not going to head for the table like that. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to look up. I'm going to recognize that I need to have meaning, purpose, and goal. I'm going to eat like a mensch, not like a behemoth, like a person. The second one was bakar, which is the word for cattle. The word bakar in Hebrew reminds us of the word boker. Boker means dawn which literally is to break through. Why is morning called breakthrough? Like the rays of sunlight break through the darkness of night to come into the morning. So what is it that Bakar do? They stampede, they break through barriers. And that's why people have to have fences because cattle don't have boundaries. So this is the second quality. So what does that mean? That for a person to sacrifice the bakar, the cattle, is to learn to recognize and respect boundaries between the holy and the profane, the pure and the impure, and the permitted and the forbidden. So this is, Hashem is giving us positive mitzvahs and negative mitzvahs and saying, do this and don't do that. So the work on this for ourselves is to recognize that Hashem wants boundaries. Now, people might not be 
the kind of people that they're going to break through everybody's French fence and just run ahead. They might not be that kind of person, but they might recognize that there are areas in their lives where they need to make boundaries and those boundaries aren't there. Those boundaries could be boundaries in terms of action, could be knowing when to go forward to say something and when not to go forward to say something. It could be to organize in time and space. And you could see that there is a lot of work in terms of getting the animal soul to behave, to be elevated, to, to be a mensch, to be a person which means that the godly soul takes precedence over any kind of animal behavior. The third kind of animals, son, which are flocks, these are sheep, goats, they represent the herd instinct. The powerful drive to move in a given direction because they're following the others. If you have seen a video or if you've seen in real life, uh, a flock of sheep, when they start running, they just go right after them. The sheep just run after the next sheep. It's actually very interesting. They can't even see where they're going because there's not enough space. The flock just pushes forward almost like one thing. They just keep going. This is not how a human being behaves or should not behave. And we see in our own tradition that Avraham, Moshe, and the prophets were known to stand apart from the, from the herd, to be different, to challenge the idols of the age and to refuse to give in to the intellectual pressures of the time. Avraham was called Avraham Ha'ivri. It was like he's, the world is standing over there and he's standing on the other side of the river by himself because that when he saw that what was going on was not serving God, didn't matter what everybody else did. He did not do that. He did what he was meant to see. Now, this is so essential for us. And that's the meaning of holiness in Judaism. Kadosh, the word for holy, is something separate, different, set apart, distinctive. And Jews were the only minority in history that consistently refused to assimilate to the dominant culture or convert to the dominant faith. Now, we see this, that the surrounding culture comes up with ideas like the idol worship at the time of Avraham. And they just did it. They didn't believe in what they were doing the famous story of, uh, of Avraham the Medrash that said that his father was an idol worship, an idol maker, and that um, Avraham came and he was, he was quite young and he put a hammer into the, he smashed up all the idols in the shop, except the biggest one. And then he put a hammer in the hand of the biggest one and left that one standing with the hammer. His father came in, all the merchandise was on the floor in pieces. He said, what happened? And Avram said to him, he did it and pointed to the art, art idol. And, the, and his father said, you know that that can't do anything. So why is he worshiping it? And why is he selling? He doesn't even believe in it. And Recently, actually, somebody said to me, okay, so what if that's all true? So you got to just do what people are doing. This is the animal of the herd instinct. And this is something that is not appropriate for us. To, we have to think we are who we are. What is it that I'm kadosh? What is it that God wants us to do? So each of these are ways that we need to work on ourselves and offer that animal to Hashem. And it's even very interesting. There are some places where it talks about 
how one person is more like a bull and another person is more like a sheep. And you have to know what your tendencies are so that you can work on fixing those things. So the, the noun korban, sacrifice, and the word lahakriv, to offer something as a sacrifice, actually means that which is brought close and the act of bringing close. And the key element is not so much giving up something, which is the usual meaning of sacrifice, but rather bringing something close to God. So the point is, we don't wanna destroy the animal, we need the animal. The animal has to do with the life force. In Hasidu, we don't believe in, you know, fasting so you don't eat anything, don't sleep, sleep on a hard bed. That's not, that's not part of Hasidu. The animal also is capable of elevating itself and going to a higher level and being part of the service of God. So we're not trying to destroy the animal, but we're trying to bring the animal close to God. So lahakriv is to bring the animal element within us to be transformed through the divine fire that once burned on the altar and still burns at the heart of prayer if we look for closeness to God. And it's a very interesting thing. There are a number of meanings for this. First of all, there was in the time of the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash, Hashem sent a divine fire from above. We are supposed to offer a fire from below to burn the korban, but Hashem sent a fire from above to take up the korban. Doesn't mean that it wasn't eaten, but that Hashem was accepting the korban. Looking at the fire from below, we are meant to keep a fire burning the whole time. And the fire is in the heart of us. One meaning of that is enthusiasm in prayer, but it's also enthusiasm in serving God. That what we do needs to be done with enthusiasm, with that fire, that whatever we're doing is an offering. That's something that, that we need to do now. This is, you could also see how this has to do with intention. Because when somebody is bringing his animal soul to God to do something, it, when we just like do stuff, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't feel alive. And what is the animal? The animal is life, the animal is alive. And we, when we do with enthusiasm, what can I do for Hashem today? How can I do this? And we see this, you know, we all know this in our lives in all kinds of ways. When the children come home from school, the mothers are all, hi, Zizkite, hi, sweetie, how are you? And five minutes ago, they were annoyed because the laundry wasn't still, wasn't dry yet. Child comes in and they light the fire in their hearts or they stoke the fire so that it should be higher. And the truth is that we should be doing this about whatever we're doing. So when the person is doing the laundry, it is so that there should be, what, what do you think that the Kohanim were doing in the Beis HaMikdash? They were cleaning, they were shechting, they were butchers, they were, offering all kinds of things. There, there, were the people, there were wicks made and there was oil that was sorted out to go to the right place. And there were spices that were being, it was you know a kitchen, but it was more than a kitchen. It was a whole house. And this work was done with awe and with enthusiasm. And when the animal in us is doing things with awe and enthusiasm, then we are really, really serving God not just on the outside, but the godly soul is on top, guiding the animal soul how to reach out to Hashem. So it's interesting that in these days, there are people, Lahavdil, who think that Darwin's theory is correct. And they think that people are animals. 
and they think that the nefesh of Bahamit, the animal soul, is all there is. But it isn't true. And many people live as if they're animals. They believe it. So that's who they think they are. So that gives them license to do whatever they feel like doing. But those who learn inner Torah understand that it's through sacrifice that we become who we are really meant to be. Now we're saying sacrifice is not destructive, it's directing. So we can, now we spoke about the different animals. We can redirect our animal instincts. We can rise above mere survival. We are capable of making and honoring boundaries. And we can step outside our environment. That's what learning really is. That's what connecting to Hashem really is. That's what davening really is. That's what doing action as a mitzvah really is. It's stepping outside of our environment to bring godliness here and to offer to Hashem. So sacrificing our animal natures to go higher than our original instincts is how we fulfill our purpose to rise above our own natures. Go higher than our original instincts. It's actually interesting that um, there's a concept of a second nature, that if a person has a first nature, which is the nature that you have, you know, some children are smiling right from the beginning and some people are screaming right from the beginning and they have different, different natures, that's just how it is. But when we work on our nature, even a good nature, an example is a loving person. A loving person, thank God, that person has a good nature, born with a good nature, what a bracha. But when the person wants to offer that nature to Hashem and wants to, you know, somebody who has a good nature will say yes to everything. Sure, why not? Whatever, sure. That's, that's their, that is where they go to. But when a person thinks I'm here to serve God, they're also thinking, what does God want? Not just to say yes all the time, because we have chesed, Gavura and Teferet. So Chesed is saying, sure, yes. Gavura is saying, just a minute, there needs to be a boundary. This is not a good thing for me to do right now, or this is too much. Or maybe I should look at the whole thing and say, how can I do this thing in a balanced way so that I do it in the way I really feel is what Hashem wants me to do, or I I've thought about what does Hashem want me to do and do that amount and not more. And to ferret is to know with compassion how to balance the two. Compassion is always a little to the right side. And, but it is acknowledging the boundaries. So having these boundaries is essential so that we could, so what happens then Let's say we take this chesed and thank God for having a, a loving nature. It's a big bracha. And we start to work with how does Hashem want me to give? Where does Hashem want me to say yes? Where does Hashem want me to say enough? In a loving way, of course, but enough. When we do that and we develop our quality of chesed, of loving kindness, we get a second nature. So the second nature does not automatically say yes. The second nature is loving, but is considering where is it a good place to give, to say yes. Also in a way that's balanced with knowing where is not. So the second nature is what happens when a person is working with their own animal nature to get to a more refined way. So we are sacrificing our animal natures to go higher than our original instincts, to get to a second nature so that we can fulfill our purpose to rise above our own first natures. 
So that means we can transcend the behema, the bakar, and the tzon. We can take these qualities and go beyond them. Now, no animal is capable of self-transformation, but we are not, we are not self-centered animals. So the sacrifices were the medium through which closeness and intimacy were established between God and man, and also between God and every aspect of the world at large. Now, every person has a spark of God within him, a spiritual potential that is infinite and unbounded like God himself. And even though every person has an animal nature, which is the part of his personality that is dealing, as we said before, with eating, drinking, sleeping, and doing anything that will make him satisfied, this is not evil. This is part of physical life. But if fulfilling wants and desires is all that a person does throughout his life, he would be ignoring his potential to make the world better. So both the godly soul and the animal soul need to communicate between the two. And this was the purpose of bringing a sacrifice. It was a process of growth in which a person elevated the animal inside himself. And he's, the person is elevating his own animal and teaching it to look upward and appreciate a higher purpose. So the animal itself in us can be taught. It's really amazing that the animal inside ourselves can actually be taught to have great respect for the godly soul. Wow, you really wanna do that? That's amazing. I wanna help you do that, let's do that. And then you see that the person who says, you know, let me bring matzah to somebody who can't get out. And the, it's the godly soul that says, let's do the mitzvah, let's bring the matzah. And the animal says, I want to do it too. I'm coming with you. I'm getting in the car, I'm driving the car, I'm going to bring, I'm going out and bringing that matzah. We see that the animal becomes supportive of the godly soul. And on the altar was burning godly fire. The flames that miraculously descended from heaven and that each of us has in our hearts. So we have to always remember, God wants what is our part to do and we have to be enthusiastic about what we're in the world to do. This is something, when we say moda anila fanecha in the morning when we wake up and we remember that I'm here in God's presence, you need to say it with enthusiasm. Some one way to say it is to focus on the words. Mode means consciousness, acknowledgement. Anila fanecha, I'm before you. Melech, chai v'kayam. Living, existing king. When we say, see that you return my soul to me. Now it might not, great is your faith in me. We wake up in the morning. It's up to us to light that fire. And saying moda ani isn't always saying excited about the same word. Consciousness, moda, recognizing, thank you for giving me consciousness. I'm standing before you. Or great is your faith in me. This is something that we have to do to work with our enthusiasm. So when we offer an animal on that altar and we have it consumed by this godly fire, this is paralleling our efforts to add the fire of spirituality into our everyday material experience. When we have an opportunity to do something, let's do it with the awareness that Hashem is giving us everything that we have. We belong to Hashem. The children belong to Hashem. The homes belong to Hashem. The food belongs to Hashem. Everything we have not only comes from Hashem, but it belongs to Hashem. And when we know this and we are grateful, then we bring life into it. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me this opportunity. So living with this enthusiasm is really, really essential. Now, the Torah is teaching us that coming to close to God 
is dependent on each of us. It's up to us to do this work. We learn Torah and we do what we can to uplift ourselves, which also means to go beyond self-interest and look for goals that will be good for mankind and the world. Now, when we bring the animal within us close, karov, korban, tashem, we are lifting up the material, which then becomes a vessel for the spiritual. And we become, we become transformed. We're not just slaves of nature, but servants of the living king. So we don't believe that nature controls us. We believe there is only one God and we are here to serve God. And that is the purpose, that is a purpose, a major purpose of the animal sacrifices. So I want to take just a few more minutes <coughs> and may we accomplish this. May we be refined. May our animal soul be, have a second nature. May our animal soul serve the godly soul and be part of serving God. And this is the work that we are here to do. We are now in the month of Nisan. We are heading for, toward Pesach. God willing, next week we'll have a class on Pesach. But this is the month of redemption. So I want to make a parallel point from the, what we've been talking about. Now on Rosh Chodesh Nisan, on this month of redemption, Moshe was told to instruct the people to bring a lamb into their homes on the 10th of Nisan to tie it down and keep it there for four days. Can you imagine that? A lamb, they're not so small. We're not talking about a stuffed animal. We're talking a real animal, very big, and bring it into the house, making its noises and doing what it does. And you're bringing that into your home for four days. And on the 14th of Nissan, they were to sacrifice the lamb put the blood on the lintels of the doors, and then eat a portion of the lamb. Now, how did they feel during those four days? Taking the lamb in the first place was a little complicated emotionally. Now, I just wanna point out that different people are different. And what one person, what's bothering one person is not necessarily the same as what's bothering another person. What is in one person's animal soul is not necessarily the same as another person's animal soul. So we were saying that one of the animals that has the herd instinct, and we're talking about lambs, their herd instincts. We were talking also about idol worship. Many Jews got sunk into the idolatry of Egypt. They were also worshiping animals. Even if they were not, they were aware that the Egyptians were worshiping animals. So what that meant is they, for many people, they were afraid. What are the Egyptians gonna say? And the Egyptians said, what are you doing with that lamb? Why are you taking a lamb into your house? Why are you tying a lamb down in your house? Why are you all doing this? And they said, can you imagine the inner transformation that they were going through? to elevate the animal in themselves and to say, God, our God told us that we should take these sheep into our houses and tie them down and for four days and we're going to sacrifice them and then we're going out of Egypt. The courage to say that, what they went through on the inner level to have the courage to say, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing because this is what God wants me to do. No matter what. You imagine this? And they went beyond their fears. And they also realized that it wasn't so pleasant having an animal around doing what it was doing in the house. And it helped them to recognize their own qualities that were animalistic or unrefined. <laughs> recognizing, am I, am, I'm a little bit like that myself sometimes help them to get beyond their ego self image. Who am I? I am here to serve God. So they gave over their animal qualities to have a moon to have faith in God. 
And this allowed them to go out of their slave mentality to follow God out to freedom. And this process continues as we work to elevate our own godly soul and together with the godly soul to serve God. Some of our work here in tefillah and prayer, we do some of this and we bring ourselves to God and we speak the words of the offering and we show up. We show up for tefillah, we show up for service of God, working to elevate ourselves through the words of the tefillahs. And these are the daily offerings of ourselves to God. I want to say that the Ansheh Knesset HaGadolah, the, the sages of the great assembly, had to, there were not originally official prayers. Originally, they were sacrifices. And so they took the concepts of the sacrifices, these were great sages, and they put them into the prayers. And, and also we actually speak the words like on Shabbat, we say, and on Shabbat we offer, and it says exactly what the, what the offering is on Shabbat, and on Rosh Chodesh, and the offering is. And we say the prayers of what we would like to be and what we would like to arise to, and then we say this, but what's very important is really to show up for God. This is essential. So we continue to work on this. I just would like to mention that for the, um, when we go through Pesach, it is transformative. We'll speak about that next week, God willing. And also after Pesach, we count Svirat HaOmer. And what are we doing? We are working on each of the qualities that we have in our animal soul. We're working on chesed of chesed, loving kindness of loving kindness. And then the, the no aspect of the yes and the balancing aspect of the yes. And for those who would like to know that, I have a series on Chabad.org. You can look it up uh, under my name. They're short videos, 20 minutes each, on each of the qualities that we are looking on. So may we actually do what we are here to do. May we transform our animal souls to be working with the godly soul to serve Hashem. And then the animal soul itself will become refined and, and elevated and be a true sacrifice to Hashem, which will bring us close to God all the time. So may we accomplish what we are here to accomplish with joy and enthusiasm. Amen.